Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about the concept of temperature. And temperature is a way that we measure the motion of particles. Essentially, when an object is hotter, it means that the particles are moving faster. And when it's colder, it means that they are moving slower. So we're going to take a look at this in terms of the physical definition of temperature as we begin our unit on heat. So temperature is really a matter of perception. What is hot and what is cold? It can depend on your perception. And you can do an example with this. You can take your hands and put one hand in hot water and another hand in cold water. Well, if you then have a bucket of room temperature water and you place both hands into it, what do you notice? And what you will find is that the hand that was in hot water all of a sudden feels like it is very cold. That water is quite cold, whereas the hand that was in cold water will be trying to tell you that it is quite hot by moving into this slightly warmer water. So it can be a matter of perception. Now, as I already mentioned at the start, science in science, temperature is a measure of the average velocities of the particles in a substance. This is what a thermometer is measuring. And because we are looking at the velocities of the particles, that means that there is a absolute minimum temperature that you can reach because you can continue to slow down the particles their average velocities can get closer and closer to zero and reaching zero would give you a temperature of what we call absolute zero the coldest something can possibly be because the particles start moving well once they stop moving anything any movement in them would increase the temperature so there is no way for them to go below this temperature so let's first of all talk a little bit about expansion with temperature. What happens to materials when they are put in hotter or colder substances? And what we find is that things will undergo an expansion or a contraction when they are put in areas of higher or lower temperature. And we can define that that change in length that will occur. It depends on three things. It depends on the temperature, the material, and the length itself. And we can write that as the change in length is equal to alpha. And alpha here is the coefficient of linear expansion. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It depends on the length of the material to start. And it depends on the change in temperature. Now you'll note that they're all directly proportional. So a longer object will stretch more or contract more under a change in temperature. As the temperature change is greater, the, ch the change in length will be greater as well. Now alpha is a coefficient of expansion and we've put that here. That is the first column in this table and that shows what the coefficient of expansion is for various materials. So some things will be able to uh, contract or expand much more easily and some things will have a much harder time. So the greater the uh, the greater the coefficient, the larger this is, the easier it will be able to expand, the larger the expansion will be. So you can see something like, say, quartz at 0.4 times 10 to the 6 has a very small coefficient of expansion and will not change very much. Um, we can also have things that have a much higher coefficient of expansion, things like lead. Lead is 29 times 10 to the negative 6th, meaning it is many times, about 60 times greater expansion coefficient than uh, the quartz that we talked about previously. So if we look at those two quartz here and lead up here, there's a very big difference in those two, meaning that if you do the same temperature change on the same length of material, the lead will expand or contract much larger. And that coefficient simply depends on the properties of the material. What are the chemical properties and physical properties of the material that is undergoing the expansion? 
So let's look at a couple of examples here and talk about some of this. And we'll come back and look at an example of linear expansion in a minute. But first of all, let's look at a temperature conversion. Let's go through some of the temperature conversions that we can look at. And what we want to do is we want to look at the three different temperature scales. And that is our, those are the Fahrenheit scale up on top ranging from a freezing point of water at 32 degrees to a boiling point at 212 and a absolute zero of negative 459.67 degrees and remember that's as cold as you can possibly get the celsius scale goes from an absolute zero of negative 273.15 degrees and on the celsius scale water freezes at zero and boils at 100. Now the last scale, which is less commonly used in everyday life, but is often used in scientific work, is the Kelvin scale. Now the Kelvin scale is nice because there are no negative temperatures. The lowest temperature is defined to be absolute zero at zero degrees. So it's essentially the same as the Celsius scale, just offset by 273.15 degrees. So water freezes at 273.15 and boils at 373.15 degrees. So the size of a degree, a Kelvin degree and a Celsius degree are exactly the same. Now we can also convert between these and that's what we're going to look at here is we are going to convert 25 degrees Celsius about room temperature to Fahrenheit and into Kelvins. So let's go ahead and look at this and we have that the given our given value is the temperature being 25 degrees Celsius. In order to convert Fahrenheit to Kelvin you take uh, sorry, in order to convert Celsius into Fahrenheit, you take the Celsius temperature, multiply it by nine fifths, and then add 32. So if you do this, you will get 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So 25 degrees Celsius is the equivalent of about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we can also convert this into Kelvin. And in order to convert to Kelvin, uh, it's a much easier conversion because the scales are just offset a little bit. And that means that all you have to do to convert to Kelvin is to take the Celsius temperature and add 273.15. So 25 degrees would then convert to 298 Kelvin. So that would be a roughly room temperature would be 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit and 298 Kelvin. Now we want to look a little bit about what we call thermal equilibrium. And the first statement here is what we sometimes call the zeroth law of thermodynamics. We'll look later at thermodynamics and talk about the first and second laws, but we're going to look at the zeroth law here, which simply states that if there are two systems that are in thermal equilibrium with each other, so they are in thermal equilibrium with each other, and if B is in thermal equilibrium with C, then A is also in equilibrium with C. So A and B were in thermal equilibrium. If B and C are also in thermal equilibrium, then A and C are in thermal equilibrium as well. So if it's kind of a co combining how the temperatures of these will balance together. If one thing is in equilibrium with another, uh, two things are in equilibrium with the same thing, then they're also in equilibrium with each other. The other thing we want to look at is that heat will always naturally flow from hotter objects to cooler objects tending to equalize their temperature. So if you have a hot cup of coffee sitting out and you leave it there for a while it will eventually cool down. If you have a cold drink sitting out it will eventually warm up. So the temperatures are trying to equalize. And if you leave them sitting for a long enough time the temperatures will be essentially the same. So let's go ahead and we want to look at a little bit of an example of thermal expansion here. And when we talk about thermal expansion, it is related to the change in temperature. A greater temperature change means greater expansion. 
and it also depends on the amount of material. So all materials will expand, but they will expand by differing amounts. So it depends on what the type of material is. Now we can think this can also cause damage. This is one of the ways that uh, things get damaged between transitions between heat and cold. Maybe not the first time, but as things are constantly over many seasons stretched and contracted, they will eventually break. And that's one of the reasons you notice in our image here, if you drive over a bridge, you often notice that there are these kind of plates here. Well, these plates move back and forth as things compress or expand. So when the bridge gets hotter and expands, they will stretch out a little bit, allowing for the bridge to give so that it doesn't get damaged. And they will also contract as things get colder. They can compress together a little bit, still allowing vehicles to go over easily, but allowing for some compression and some expansion to keep the bridge from eventually being damaged by the continual expansion and contraction as you go through the various seasonal changes. Now, let's look at an example of how this expansion works and we can look at an example of a bridge here. And if we look at the span of a bridge as being 1,275 meters long, and it is exposed to temperature changes that vary from 15 degrees below zero Celsius to 40 degrees above zero Celsius. And we want to look at the change in the length of this bridge if it is made of steel. Remember, it depends on what we're made of. So this actually matters. And that actually can take us back to that table that we looked at earlier that gave us the coefficients of expansion. So you can get the coefficient of expansion of steel as 12 times 10 to the negative 6 from this table, which is also a table from chapter 13 of the textbook that we use. So let's go back and look at this problem and let's write up our numbers that we know and we know the length 1275 meters. We know that the change in temperature is what? Well it ranges from plus 40 to minus 15. That's a difference of 55 degrees Celsius. And then we also know that the coefficient of expansion of steel is 12 times 10 to the negative 6. And remember we can get that from our table in the textbook which lists the various expansion coefficients that we may need. So we can use our equation that we talked about earlier change in length is equal to the coefficient here multiplied by the length multiplied by the change in temperature. So all we have to do is multiply these three numbers and that will give us the change in length of this bridge. And what we'll find if we go ahead and do that is that we put the numbers in and we multiply them out and we find that this bridge changes by a length of almost one meter between the hottest and the coldest temperatures. Now that may not seem like a lot out of 12, 1275 meters, but it is actually quite a decent amount. And you can imagine things changing by that amount is going to put an inordinate stress on the materials. And it may not snap the first time, but over many seasons of doing this, it eventually will deteriorate the structure of the bridge. So that's one of the reasons we have things like those expanding plates built into bridges so that they can have some room to expand or contract and keep them from being damaged. All right, the other thing we want to look at now, we talked about expansion in one dimension. We can also look at it in two dimensions. So in two and three dimensions, in two dimensions, there is a change in area. And in three dimensions, there is a change in volume. So in two dimensions, it's pretty much just like what we looked at before. Alpha is the same coefficient of linear expansion, except now instead of the length, we want the area of the object. We still want the change in temperature. And it's multiplied by two because it's in two dimensions. You're expanding in both directions. So the area will actually expand more than just each individual dimension. For three dimensions, there is another coefficient called the volume, a coefficient of volume expansion. And you multiply that by the volume. 
and the change in temperature. So the structure is the same. Now the volume coefficients are also given in that same table that we looked at uh, at the beginning and we can go back and look at that here. If we look at that table, that second table gives us a coefficient of volume expansion as well in the second column. And there are numbers that you can use for that if we're looking at those. Please note that most gases have the same coefficient of volume expansion and do not have in, in volume liquids and gases do not have any coefficient of linear expansion. So if we're talking about linear expansion or area two dimensional expansion, we're only talking about solids. When we talk about volume expansion, we can look at liquids and gases as well. So let's go back to what we had here. And what were we looking at? We looked at the uh, coefficients. Let's go ahead and look at an example of these. So in this case, we are going to look at a gas tank and fuel expansion. So we are looking at a volume of 60 liters worth of gas and it is a steel gas tank and they both have a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. How much gasoline will spill by the time they reach 35 degrees Celsius? So remember both are going to expand. The gas will expand and the tank will expand. But remember that gas ha will, will expand more. So if you have a very full gas tank and it, it, it heats up, it can overflow because of this. So let's go ahead and look at our uh, materials here. Let's put in what we know. We have the coefficient of expansion for steel. We know that standard coefficient of expansion for gas. And we, we can find out then by going through is as the gas gas vaporizes then we can look at the change in volume of the steel is equal to the beta for steel times the delta temp the temperature so times the temperature coefficient for gas it is equal to the beta for gas that we have up here times the volume of the gas that we have times the change in temperature and if we put these in, the volume of the spill is the difference between these two. It's the change in volume of gas minus the change of volume of the steel. So if the steel, if they change by the same amount, there would be no spillage. If the steel's expanded greater, then it would be, uh, then there would still be no expansion. But we know that the gas is going to expand more and therefore leave us with some spillage that we're going to calculate here. So the volume of the spill is equal to the beta of the gas minus the beta of the steel uh, times the volume times the change in temperature. And if we put our numbers in there, that's 950 minus 35, and they're both times 10 to the sixth. And we multiply that by the 60 liter volume and the 20 degree change in temperature means that the spillage would be about a liter out of that 60 liter tank. So that's looking at two. We're doing two expansions together there. And we know because they're different materials that one is going to expand more than the other. So let's go ahead. We looked at a couple of examples here and let's get ready to finish up looking at the thermal stresses. And we kind of talked a little bit about these two, uh, these kind of things. But thermal stress is caused by the constant expansion and contraction as temperature changes. So depending on where you live in the world, the further north where temperature changes are more extreme. So I guess more those middle latitudes where temperatures go from very cold in the winter to very warm in the summer can cause significant damage and potholes in the roads are one of those that we know quite well. So over time expansion and contraction will slowly damage and eventually a weak spot will be found where the pothole will be formed. We get the same things from weathering of rocks, uh, rupturing of a tank, 
when materials if material is inside it and expands too much. We use glass cooking pans. Why? Because their thermal expansion is much less. We looked at our table had quartz and right above that was Pyrex, which is often used for cooking because it has a relatively low expansion rate and will therefore be able to stand the stress of being constantly heated and cooled. And dental fillings are another thing that have to be able to withstand temperature changes. You don't want a dental filling that is going to change significantly when you eat hot food versus when you're eating cold food. Yes, they will change a little. Obviously, you do not want them to change too much. So let's go ahead and finish up as we do with our summary. And what we find, what we looked at in this section, was the temperature was a measure of the average kinetic energies, essentially the velocities of the particles in a substance. We noted that objects will reach thermal equilibrium as heat is transferred from a hotter object to a cooler object. And we talked about thermal stresses which occur when there are changes in temperatures, especially when they're rapid or when the material is unable to expand and contract freely. So if it's allowed to expand and contract freely, of course, nothing will happen. If you just have one object of one expansion rate, say a bar of metal, and it gets heated up and cooled, then it won't matter. It will not change. It's when it is confined or unable to expand or contract freely that we will get those thermal stresses, which can cause some damage. So that concludes this lecture on temperature. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.